So welcome, uh, everybody. Welcome, dear Guberna members, for this um, new uh, Guberna Home Talk of Governance. Um, I'm very, very happy to welcome you uh, tonight for this specific uh, session. Uh, I see a lot of face in the list of participants I already know. Some uh, I don't. Welcome to all of you uh, tonight. For, um, as you know, in this uh, Home of Governance talks, uh, we give a lot of attention around uh, uh, and about the resilience topic and we take care uh, and attention to continue to support you, uh, to inspire your, you, uh, I hope tonight uh, also, um, and um, enrich your reflection uh, around governance and specifically around a sustainable or more sustainable uh, governance and resilience. Um, supplying you, exchanging with you ideas uh, around a more sustainable governance. Uh, so tonight, I'm also very honored uh, to moderate uh, this talk and to welcome our, uh, sp uh, our special uh, guest and keynote speakers tonight, the Professor Yab Winter. Uh, most of you, uh, for sure, already uh, know him as he's uh, a renowned uh, governance uh, expert. Uh, Yab uh, is professor of governance, uh, corporate governance law and behavior at the University of Amsterdam. He's also uh, a visiting professor at INSEAD. Uh, and when I was uh, preparing uh, this conversation uh, with you and with him, uh, I personally was uh, really impressed uh, and find his ideas, his thought really fascinating. Uh, so I hope you will be inspired uh, to tonight and, and maybe that uh, you will consider the, the year uh, in front of us uh, with a more uh, optimistic uh, state of mind. I sincerely hope it. Um, I also discover uh, and see uh, uh, a huge wisdom uh, in YAP, certainly based on uh, a great experience from the field, uh, as uh, YAP is also uh, active an active board member. Uh, his CV uh, curriculum is quite impressive. Uh, to give you an idea at the moment, uh, YAP uh, is the present chairman of the supervisory board at Air Erasmus University at Rotterdam uh, is also the uh, chairman of the supervisory board of Van Gogh Museum. He is the vice chairman of all the holding Randstad. Uh, he is also a board member of the Goldsmithing Foundation for People, Work and Economy. Uh, was also uh, himself partner at the Filion uh, Governance and Leadership uh, Office. Uh, thus, uh, I'm sure that he will uh, also share with you experience uh, from uh, his uh, practice uh, on, on the field around uh, the ideas we will uh, exchange tonight. So let me, I don't want to put the pressure on you, Yab, <laughs> also introducing uh, you, but uh, really, uh, I think that you deserve it. Um, and uh, especially to discuss uh, with us, with uh, our members around a uh, hot topic at the moment, governance, resilience, and purpose of the companies. So let me uh, ask you to launch uh, the, uh, the debate uh, tonight, a first question. Uh, based on the recent paper, uh, research paper that you, read, uh, you have written during uh, this crisis, this COVID crisis, um, uh, titled Addressing the Crisis of the Modern Corporate Corporation, the Duty of Societal Responsibility of the World. Here we are at the art uh, of the uh, topic also. And in your paper, Yap, you argue that the modern corporation has become Amoral, and that the core of the problem is not outside us, but uh, it is inside us. Would you uh, please share with us your arguments uh, about uh, these ideas and show us uh, how the corporation has become amoral and how individual human behaviors are creating this? 
Yes, uh, thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much for your, for your kind words um, in, in introducing me. Way too kind. Um, I, I've been thinking about this question for certainly over a decade, for maybe 15 years, working a lot in, in corporate governance and corporate law development in the Netherlands, but also at EU level, and, and becoming more and more concerned about the sort of, sort of corporate law and corporate governance reality that we have created. It, in that reality, I, I think the core orientation for a very long time has been, and it's, it's starting to shift now, but it has been for a long time, and it is still in, in many places, the, the orientation that the corporation is there to serve the financial interest of its shareholders, and mainly that, and that started with Friedman, who was the most explicit academic who stated that as a, stated that as a doctrine in 1970, now 50 years ago. Um, and basically, in, in that sort of thinking, other types of concerns, concerns for other stakeholders, employees, clients, customers, societies in which we work, but particularly also for the environment and our climate. And I think these concerns have become much stronger over the last decade. All those other concerns are actually not the concern of the corporation itself. Within the shareholder primacy thinking, all of these concerns are conceived to be externalities. They are only relevant for the corporation if and to the extent that the, the government imposes that by regulation or taxation, or if there's a direct influence or effect on reputation that you want to be careful about, and then you start to take these concerns in, into your own concern. That is what I mean with corporations having be become amoral, that the, the, the sense of having to make moral judgment to feature in your decision making the consequences of your behavior towards others. I basically think that, that we have lost sight of that to a large extent. And I don't mean this at any personal level for any individual in its role, but simply conceptually, systemically, this is what we've done. We've built systems and theories around this notion. Basic, I think the core notion, core theory in corporate governance that has, has been dominant over the last three, four decades, perhaps, is the agency theory, seeing directors as agents for shareholders that, and we seek uh, through corporate, co corporate law mechanisms to improve the ability of principal shareholders to control their agents or to have them monitor to make sure that agents don't do things that principal shareholders do not want. We've built corporate practices on that basis, variable pay to a large extent or basically only to ensure alignment of director interests with shareholder interests. The role of non-executives, which has been construed over the last two decades primarily as a role to monitor agents on behalf of shareholders as principals. Um, this has even happened in, uh, in jurisdictions like my own in the Netherlands, which consult, thought of themselves as a very stakeholder oriented model. And I think even there we see a lot of strong influence of the shareholder thinking. My point in the, in the paper that you mentioned too is this is a man-made reality. This is the reality that we have created. It's not a force outside of us who created this reality, we started to believe in this and made this real. We made this real in such a way that many people now would argue this is simply how it is, you can't change it anymore. And that gives me the sense of, of what Eric Fromm has called idolatry. We've created a golden calf of the system of financial rewards to shareholders and then worship it as something that is over us and above us that we can't influence anymore. That, I think, in the, in, if you look at the current crisis that society is in, and it's not just corona, but it's climate, it's inequality, social inequality, and so many other challenges that we face in society, that notion simply doesn't help anymore to solve these problems. Actually, they aggravate these problems. Corporations cannot consistently take more out of society than they give back to society. Corporations need to rethink about their role in society what that role actually is. And I think it takes human beings to do that. Corporations are entities legally, yes, but they are conducted, directed by human beings, people primarily who sit on boards. If we want to change the corporate narrative, and that's the, my plea in, in the, the various publications that I wrote over the last year, we have to look at ourselves again. We have to become human again and make important for corporations what is actually important for humans in society. That's the core notion that I wanted to convey. 
Thank you very much, uh, Yab, for uh, this introduction in the, the entrance in the, the topic uh, of this evening. I see that we are already receiving question, a question from Catherine Delong uh, concerning the role of, of the board. And uh, that's the point uh, we will uh, go through uh, now also that uh, then I will also read uh, the question received from Catherine. And uh, I would like to stress also about your work and, uh, and this recent uh, paper in particular because uh, in it you defend that the way society will get out of the crisis undoubtedly also depends on how business perceives its responsibility in society. And uh, you uh, defend also and you show that all solutions that have been put forward to address aspect of the problem, uh, in all of them, the role of the board is really crucial. Uh, so, uh, of course, can you tell us uh, a bit more about uh, those solutions and how the role of the board uh, could be part of the solution? And uh, Catherine Delang, one of our members, is already uh, getting one step uh, forward, asking you, uh, business and society are more than ever intertwined. So what do you think, Yap, about introducing a societal council to advise the board uh, with respect to stakeholders' issues uh, and interest, of course? Yeah. Well, thank you also for that question, Catherine. I, I think it's an extraordinarily relevant one. First, perhaps the, the, the primary the, the question Rachel put forward. I, um, if, if you look at the three possible solutions that have been put forward and are being developed in corporate law around the world, I would say, to deal with, to get away with this shareholder only or financial reward only type of corporate system. The first is the re a reduction of shareholder rights. Simply remove some shareholder rights to alleviate the pressure of shareholders that they can levy on boards. I think that's one mechanism. Second is a stronger involvement of stakeholders. We classically have in Europe, in the Rhineland countries, the employee determination, co-determination systems, which is a bit of one-sided, only looks at interest of employees, not so much climate environment, but it is a way to engage a key stakeholder more in the decision. And thirdly, the emphasis on, on formulating a stronger purpose of the organization that links the organization back to society. My point is in all three of these mechanisms, you need actually a board that directs the corporation forward to be committed to do exactly that and to take on this societal role. And that's why I thought that in addition to all these solutions, you would have to have somehow an explicit uh, commitment of the board, a duty of the board to feel societally responsible. In the Netherlands, with a, a group of other uh, uh, professors, we have put forward a proposal to include in Dutch corporate law in the, in the duties of directors an explicit reference to the duty of societal responsibility to ensure that the corporation conducts itself as a responsible corporate citizen. I think that's the core notion that we have put forward. Um, the, y your suggestion, Catherine, absolutely makes sense. In When we proposed this in the Netherlands, we had a lot of criticism and responses to this and that all only makes sense we need to debate this sort of thinking we need to have dialogues like we are having today to to develop our thinking in this field and figure out what is most effective in our response to all those reactions we have specifically suggested that a particularly large listed companies with have which have huge impact in society should indeed indeed introduce as a matter of best practice some sort of society societal council that advises the board on aspects of societal responsibility, taking into account explicitly the perceptions, the interests that different stakeholders may have. So yes, indeed, to feed the board in its responsibility for society, it may be very helpful to make use of representatives of societal areas that are relevant for the corporation, include them in a societal council or board or whatever you want to make them sort of influence you by giving you advice, but also to some extent report to them how you believe your societal impact is actually improving or how you go about it and what you want to achieve, et cetera. So yes, your, your thinking would be precisely as my thinking is. 
Thank you, Yap. Uh, I see that we are receiving still uh, other questions. Uh, maybe uh, we will uh, keep a moment to, to go on more deeply uh, into the, the role uh, of the board also. I see Christophe uh, Makurs is addressing you a question and ask you, uh, do you see a specific role in the respect of the independent directors or is it uh, this reducing the topic? Um. Yeah, I, I will think of that. I think it's actually both what you suggest. You would probably say yes, independent directors more than any other director would, would be in a position to ask attention for that balancing of interest to take into account other interests than only shareholder. Absolutely. So in that sense, yes, but I, I also agree with the latter part of your question. It should be the responsibility of all, all board directors perhaps even more so of those directors who represent their shareholder interests, that they are also responsible for balancing those interests that they represent on the board with interests that the corporation has to take into account. Um, otherwise, it is just a lonely exercise of two or three or five members on the board and the rest, the rest can sit back and relax and only think about their particular shareholder concern. I don't think that would create a rich and, and healthy board dynamics indeed. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and uh, around this idea of uh, a duty of so uh, societal responsibility of the board, uh, we are receiving uh, other question, uh, and I would like uh, and love uh, indeed to make a parallel with the words uh, words that you quote of the poet T. S. Eliot, uh, because we are entering in this type of, of question. Uh, T. S. Eliot is uh, writing the uh, if. Uh, uh, if you allow me, I will read uh, the, 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 the words of the poet. Uh, is writing, they constantly try to escape from the darkness outside and within by dreaming of systems so perfect that no one will need to be good. This was quite uh, maybe uh, a paradox for the monitoring role of the board uh, and perhaps also for the leadership uh, role of, of the board, very uh, uh, important uh, one. And uh, Catherine Delange is asking you uh, then, uh, do we need more regulation to accelerate humans to change their behaviors? And if yes, what's then the risk of thick uh, boxing attitudes or should the pressure come for the institutional uh, investors? Yeah, great, great questions and, and all very relevant. I, when I came first across this, this quote from Eliot, uh, it really start, uh, start, uh, struck a chord within me. This is a quote from a poem in 1934, it's 1934, almost 90 years ago, and he already says that we are in the process of constant building systems so that we no longer have to be good ourselves anymore as human beings. And I think that that, that, that that actually displays a lot of what we are currently doing. When there is a crisis we res and people have conducted themselves irresponsibly, we build more rules, bigger systems, larger procedures, more compliance, more supervision and inspection, more sanctioning in order to prevent people from making those mistakes again. And the end result of that paradoxically is that we feel less and less responsible for our own behavior. We feel only responsible for complying with the system and with the rules and with the box ticking. Um, to get out of this, I, I am not propagating that we should do away with all rules. Although in some areas they seem to work actually that there's been a great experiment in, in the south of Holland in Limburg where they changed all the, the, the road signs and uh, the, the various signals around roundabouts, took them away completely so you have no indication who actually has priority on those roundabouts. Actually, the number of accidents came down because people had to pay attention themselves rather than stupidly following the rules, assuming that you have priority, although you see that another car is not giving you the priority. So in some areas, actually move, removing rules might be a good thing. I, I'm not suggesting we remove everything, not at all. But we should not, definitely not re, start to rely on systems and rules as good replacements of our own judgments in, more, in moral atmospheres, but also in inspirational matters. We destroy ourselves. We destroy who we are as human beings if we consistently do so. Um, 
So for me, the solution for this conundrum of societal responsibility is not to make, for the government to make more and more rules piling on corporations about what they can and cannot do. It is actually relying on the people who direct the corporation to make the right sort of judgment with the possibility, yes, that they will make mistakes. And then law, to some extent, under some circumstances, should be able to correct those mistakes rather than building up a new system to make sure that nobody else makes those mistakes again. I think that's the pitfall where we've gone to and we should move ourselves out of that again. And I think that only works if we are willing to become human again, also in the boardroom. With all our failures, admitting that we all, all, not always see it right immediately, with our uncertainties about what we can achieve and cannot achieve, and, and take away the illusion of everything can be made certain if you only have rational design systems that think and spell it out for you. That is simply not good enough anymore. Thank you, yeah. Um, uh, uh, co concerning this paradox uh, with the, 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 the regulation and the, the, the rigid uh, norms and the, the, the human behaviors, um, uh, how uh, could you reintegrate the profound digital transformation of our society in this paradox? Uh, do you see uh, the, the digital transformation we are uh, living at the, mo at the moment as an optimistic opportunity for improving the resilience, in particular, of the organization? Well, it's a, a sword that, that cuts on both sides, obviously. I, I think digital transformation has tremendous promises for us in, in the sense that we, we can have access to information that we never had before. Um, so we can deepen our knowledge and understanding with that information in, in ways that we have never been able to do so before. Um, I do believe there is a, a scope for artificial intelligence that help us to take decisions in a much better in, and informed way take away some of the, the obvious mistakes that our human mind simply makes uh, because we're not perfect in our analysis, in our rationality, in, in our perception even. Um, in that sense, digital transformation could be an enormous help for us to improve. However, there is obviously a risk that digital transformation and artificial intelligence take over our own judgments. And then the big risk, and this is a core challenge in the whole development of artificial intelligence, that much has been writing about this. Can we make artificial intelligence human? Can we make it in such a way that our human notions of morality, the, the sense of obligation and responsibility that we have towards each other, to others, the sense of responsibility that we have towards the world as a whole, can we somehow ingrain that in artificial intelligence? Or can we at least build in systems of in these systems of artificial intelligence moments for human judgment, for our decision making and not solely relying on the machine decision making. I think that's a crucial challenge going forward. Um, uh, to say at one level more specifically, most of the artificial intelligence and digital transformation is now about big data, analyzing big data and finding patterns in them which we as human beings simply cannot do because we don't have the data available for ourselves. One of the things we seem to lose in that process is the ability that we have as humans being to actually make judgment on the basis not so much of big data, but on what we call rich data. Data about a specific context with all relevant factors that are relevant for that context rather than just a few aspects on the basis of which if you take them out of every person, and you build them over a million persons, you have a pattern of behavior that's thin. It's very thin data, but very big in size and volume. While our judgment in the context in which we live uh, very much is able to bring all the relevant circumstances. Why is this situation different from the situation we had last year? Why should we take a different decision this year than last year? Um, that is what, what philosophers have always called since Aristotle, practical wisdom. Phronesis, the, the, the wisdom to understand that in the context of this situation, we need this decision and not another decision. That is an, an ability, a human ability that we might lose if we rely only on digital systems and artificial intelligence to bring us forward. 
and yeah, but I see other questions are, are coming concerning uh, this shift in the boardroom uh, culture. Uh, uh, another question is coming about it and uh, uh, asking you, uh, is this shift in boardroom culture uh, meaning uh, in terms of board diversity, not only gender, but also in age, in mindset? Should we completely reboot uh, the way we select and evaluate board directors to help yeah, um, well, it is absolutely relevant. When when we make societal responsibility a core notion that boards should take into account, we cannot have only on people on board who are able to make financial judgments and investment judgments and, and understanding risk from a financial perspective only. We need people who are also sensitive to other concerns that are relevant for the corporation. Human concerns in our staff, concerns of the communities in which we work, concerns in climate and environmental matters, that requires different um, knowledge, different experience, different backgrounds, different age, perhaps different perceptions. I think one of the core questions is always is, is becoming stronger and stronger. How do we include in our decision making the position of future generations? Um, if if we allow people to take decisions that are always around on on average my age, I'm 57 now. Um, how, we, how far is my horizon that I can imagine for myself? That is fundamentally different from somebody who is 25 and has a perspective of another 60, 70 years of life, hopefully happily life on this earth. How do we include those perceptions? I think the challenge is um, if, if you want all those elements and those perspectives and perceptions to become relevant, it is very hard to all make them relevant within the board context by representation by a certain person you would probably then get to boards with enormous sizes that not necessarily make the work of the board easier. So to some extent, and one of the ideas I put forward is that sometimes you simply have to extend the board for a particular issue with one or two experts who are expert in that area and that work, work with the board on a more, much more consistent, in a much more consistent manner on that specific, specific topic going forward. And when the topic, uh, slides away or is no longer relevant or is not relevant in a particular meeting, those persons would not be part of the board. We call that an ex-board concept, the extended board. So um, you have a core board of people who have the formal governance responsibility. But you can extend the board with those people who can give you those perspectives that are relevant for your decision making going forward. Thank you, Gap. Yeah, I, I see um, uh, another question coming from our Secretary General, Lisbeth uh, de Ritter. Um, do you think that uh, a societal dividend also be a, uh, could be an idea to go through this challenge? Yes, uh, and thank you, Lisbeth, for that, for that uh, kind question. I, there, there is an example in the Netherlands, which is the Rabobank. Rabobank is a cooperative organization with it, as its members, other elements of the corporate environment of Rabobank. So it's not a, it doesn't pay dividend outside of the bank to shareholders, investors as a normal dividend. What it does do is to do exactly this, Lisbeth, to pay what they call a societal dividend every year. They reserve a sum of money which are, is used exclusively to help people and organizations and communities in the Dutch society to improve their situation. Uh, and it may be an investment in tooling in, in schools, for example, by, by iPads for children or IT facilities in schools in poorer areas. Might be anything, might be something environmental, uh, climate related. And they reserve huge sums of money to pay out to Dutch society, to communities in the Dutch society. As, and they see it as their responsibility to be profitable as a bank in order to be able to pay that societal dividend. So. Yes, it might be an interesting thought. It might not be appropriate for every type of organization or corporation, but for a bank like Rubble Bank, who has no external investors to whom it pays dividends, this might be a great way to contribute to society. So you're on mute, Rachel. Sorry. Christophe, uh, Macor is also asking you, if we move from a traditional director's duty of care towards a societal responsibility, isn't there an impact on the director's liability? 
Yeah, that's that's a great question um, and an absolutely a relevant question. By the by the way, I we are not suggesting to replace the duty of care with a duty of societal responsibility. The duty of care is is valid and relevant in its own right. The duty of care requires of a board member to really inform herself or himself well before they take decisions, to really understand and listen to the debate, uh, to be careful in the sense to, to apply care in the role and to apply expertise in your role to the maximum extent that you can. Um, I, I would not want to distract anything from that duty of care. I think it should be there. It's an important duty that directors have. I would want to add this duty of societal responsibility in the sense that, due, that directors include in their decision making other concerns than only the financial concerns that ultimately benefit shareholders. And those concerns can be are about it can be about human capital, their own staff, community capital, or social capital, and natural capital, the resources that we use, the impact on climate that we have. Um, does that lead to higher levels of liability? In itself, it would not change the threshold for liability. If you look at corporate law systems, typically there is a relevant ma margin of error that is, is allowed to directors by any court, by any system, whether in Belgium and the Netherlands, in the US. In the US, they call it the business judgment rule. Judges will not interfere in the business judgment of directors. And I think something like that would also apply to this duty of societal re responsibility. Only if that duty is breached in a heavy way, in a substantial way, for example, by completely ignoring the specific harm that you are doing to a certain community by, for example, polluting the area in your production process, not thinking at all about the sort of effects that that may have on the, the people who live in the area. Only in that sort of cases, questions of liabilities might come up. But if these cases come up, if you indeed fundamentally ignore the interest of the people who work, who live around the factory that you run as, a, as directors of a corporation, there actually may be good reasons to hold you personally liable for that. Thank you, yeah. Uh, you receive also a question for, from Laurent Johnson, an IT man uh, among our members, um, asking you about uh, this paradox uh, we evoked uh, uh, about uh, to establish or not uh, more rules, um, uh, and that uh, it is also be uh, it can also be brought into perspective based uh, on the idea of reinventing uh, the organization as uh, the society sociocracy uh, um, movement process or globally speaking on spiral uh, dynamics. Uh, is it there some trends in re-compliancy in longer uh, future to consider, to be considered? Yeah, if, if, I, if I understand the question well, there, there, there are modern, yeah, there are modern ways of thinking about how to organize larger complex organizations rather than through strict, strict direction and rule, rule ticking and box ticking type of exercises to give people much more freedom and judgment in their own area within the corporation and to coordinate with others themselves uh, on how to do that. The, the, the whole world of La, Frédéric Lalou, reinventing organizations, I think that's what you were alluding to, um, is a strong development in that direction. What, what I find striking and, and very encouraging actually is that that way of working seems to work not just for professional organizations where you can leave it to professionals to really make the sort of decisions in their own realm of expertise. But Lalou also mentions the example of a machine factory in Italy, which is simply a production facility. And, it, and it's complex in the sense that you have to you buy your raw materials. You have to make sure that the, the production process is effective and efficient. You have to make sure that your marketing is in line with what you can produce, etc. All of that is a, is a complex um, integration of various aspects of the business. And they seem to be able to manage that in a way without leaning overly on bureaucracy and management to, to hierarchically tell everybody what, everybody what to do. I think that is a very promising development. It shows that people can do actually much more than we have been starting to think over the last two or three decades. 
Um, I'm not sure it works everywhere well immediately everywhere. It's, it may be experimenting and you will probably see failure as well. But the fact that it can be done is very hopeful. And I think it, it, it would be part of the toolkit of every senior, any leadership of any person in a leadership role to figure out how can we uh, put our people uh, themselves in the best possible position to bring out their best to the decision making that we need to, to, to do in order to run the company effectively. Um, it's, so it's, I, I see the development as a very hopeful one. Thank you, yeah. Uh, about and maybe to, to end this huge uh, part of the discussion uh, around uh, a duty of societal responsibility in the, in, in the board. And I see there are also entrepreneurs uh, among our participants who is uh, maybe practical mind and, and question about how to implement the, the idea. Uh, I, I would like and I will make a link with the, uh, the question of Catherine who is coming also. Um, uh, what do you think, for example, about uh, the, the concerning the ESG criteria? They are very much observed, uh, but uh, what would be your recommendation for implementing ESG international standards uh, also, or maybe at least uh, European uh, ones? Uh, that's uh, uh, an aspect, and uh, and Catherine around uh, the purpose and implementation within the companies uh, is asking you uh, about the B Corp uh, certification. What's your view uh, on this initiative, and what could foster more company to make this choice? Uh, uh, would this be an answer to purpose washing, or maybe to uh, uh, enhance no, the purpose? Come on, ESG, um, I think that is a it, it is becoming more and more powerful, um, in, in, particularly also in the investment community. Institutional investors looking more and more to understand ESG standards and see whether their investments are living up to those standards or not, and to also make, take negative investment decisions to move out of corporations who simply do not want to live up to certain standards or at least avoid investing in those corporations. I think that that puts pressure from the investment community on this area, and I, I think that's very helpful. Um, that there is a risk with the ESG standards that I see, at least. Um, the in particular, institutional investors in large capital markets they they need standardized information to be able to compare various investment opportunities with one another. Um, however, core areas of societal responsibility may not lend themselves easily to standardization um, measuring in, in a way that is feasible and comparable across corporations. Some elements probably can be made, put in standards that are really comparable. I think within now and to five, maybe 10 years, we will see probably clear standards coming up for, for CO2 emissions. With what sort of activity should you be able to reduce your CO2 emissions to zero or to zero or to actually net negative? Um, I think we can we can work on that. That seems to be relatively easy to compare. But how, for example, do you compare the social impact of a corporation who has uh, plantations in in Africa or in Indonesia with the social impact that an organization like for the Ramstad Corporation that I'm on the board of has by putting people to work? That's what they do. They don't have plantations in Indonesia. They don't build hospitals for people in poor circumstances in Africa, but they put people to work. How do you compare these two? How do you measure it? What is that impact that you give access to health or access to work as the core of your business actually? It's hard to compare. So to some extent, we need not so much measurable standardized information, but we need narratives about corporate impact that we can challenge, that we can discuss, and we can have dialogues about whether that impact is strong enough or not. Not so much through measurement and standardization, but through different processes. So the yes, ESG is powerful, um, but there is a risk of overly relying on standards where you do not simply capture parts of the societal impact and responsibility that we should have in our minds. I think that's that's the the question. And what was the other question, Rachel? This was on ESG. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. Sorry about the B Corp certification and asking you your view on it. Yeah, I think it's. 
particularly in the United States and to some extent in England, uh, it is a, becoming a stronger and stronger development to move away out of the very explicit pressure of having to serve the interest of shareholders foremost. I think in those countries where that pressure is the, is the, the most explicit, you see the biggest development into B corporations. Uh, and and they, they, their rationale is to basically have a societal purpose which allows them not to only look at the interest of their investors, but also to include other interests and to work towards those other interests. Um, I think in other jurisdictions, there is a little bit of a risk that if you emphasize a specific facility for corporations who want to have that strong societal purpose too much, it may actually give the signal to other corporations that they should feel less responsible for concerns of society. If they would feel responsible, you would, would become a B corporation. And if you're not, then apparently you don't have to be responsible. That's why I think that the, a broad principle that is accepted, um, certainly across Europe, for example, and I saw another question, do, do we need European regulation there rather than national? I think broad acceptance of an understanding that European business is not just there for their own financial success, but to have right, a broad societal regard of concerns that, that are relevant for society, that would make sense. Um, and, and yes, I believe the European Union has a role to play. I, I know there are initiatives being discussed. The European Parliament has accepted some motions to, to encourage the European Commission to come up with legislation to enforce this duty of societal responsibility to some extent in, in whatever way across European Union legislation and it makes sense at least one argument for na against national regulation this would avoid and that is the argument that if you would only regulate that in Belgium or in the Netherlands this would create potentially an unlevel playing field those corporations that do not have to do this according to the national legislation can continue to, to be effective and efficient only from a financial perspective that might give them a head start today tomorrow in the in the near future um, if you want to remove that argument, indeed, it would be much better to have regulation at EU level. And that, therefore, I think it is encouraging to see that the EU is seriously in, in investigating whether this will happen or not. I, I'm uh, Having done quite a bit in preparing European Union regulation in the field of corporate law, I'm not so sure that this will result into anything quickly. Um, there might be substantial um, resistance in some member states against the movement in this direction and that may trigger long delays before the European Union can move forward. So I hope it will work. Uh, I hope it doesn't take too much time and if it works it's probably good for Europe to have union-wide regulation in this field. Thank you, Yap. I see you already answered to a question. Maybe I will read it for all of part, uh, our participants uh, from Nicola Comans, who are one of our young researchers uh, at Guberna. Uh, uh, he was asking you, how do you evaluate the proposal of the European Commission regarding sustainable corporate governance and due diligence and uh, about uh, how should the European Commission impose binding legislation in this respect or uh, is a complaint or explain approach more uh, advice. We talk also preparing this conversation about uh, the, the plans of the European Commission, especially for the supply chain uh, sector based on the e recent EY uh, report, then uh, maybe the future is not so far, <laughs> so not so that far from yeah. us. And I'm encouraged to see the initiatives again, uh, knowing how complex European legislation may actually be. It may quite may take quite some time before member states actually agree with the Commission on a proposal that is, is going far enough to the Parliament. But we'll see. And, it, and again, it's encouraging to see the, the movement. I think part of Nicholas' question is also, do we need some binding regulation or would we comply or explain would that be good enough? Um, that's, I, nobody knows the answer. That's not a black and white answer. Probably comply or explain may have some regulatory pressure. It may encourage organizations to live up to ex external expectations. I, my, my concern is somewhat different. You, you see there, there is a broad movement. Many corporations are moving in this direction without being forced by regulation. They, they start to do it themselves. There are front runners who have clearly ingrained this in their strategic outlook and the way they run their business models. 
There are those who, who want to do this, but struggle in finding out how to do it. For them, a code with Comply or Explain could actually work as an encouragement. But there is also a group of corporations that lag behind that actually do not see this as their responsibility at all. Um, and for them, a Comply or Explain me type of mechanism would simply not, not yield any type of real pressure. That's what we've seen also with Comply or Explain with corporate governance codes. In general, it works well, but it doesn't work at all for those corporations who simply don't want to do it at this stage. And then you have no force. There's no enforcement force there. There's no pressure that you can really yield. And the only thing that then works is to have some sort of binding statement. Dear directors, this is your duty under law. It's not a voluntary exercise. If you like it, you do it. If you don't like it, you don't. This is what society basically expects of you. Um, that doesn't immediately lead to liability, and it shouldn't. But if you ignore it completely, and you do harm to others in a way that could have been avoided, that may have consequences for you personally. I think that's the, the question. Do we need that sort of strong type of regulatory push to make this happen? Or do we believe more, more gentle pushing, more gentle persuasion, encouragement through comply or explain will be good enough to get us all of there? I, I myself believe that the, the, the first somewhat harder push is necessary to move those corporations who, who are for, the, for whom it is very beyond what they are currently doing. Thank you. Yeah, maybe it's time also to go a, a little bit deeper uh, to understand uh, the reality of the board and the explanation that you are proposing about that. And uh, if I may make reference to the uh, recent Libera Mekohom of our former executive director, the professor Ludgard, Ludgard Vandenberg. And I see that Ludgard is with us uh, tonight. So I, I take the opportunity to greet her very warmly. <laughs> Welcome uh, and very happy that you are with us tonight, uh, Ludgard. Um, and yeah, uh, with this, in this Liber Amico Home, you share some examples of the reality in board uh, rooms. Uh, and for you, those examples uh, show that regu uh, the regulator regulatory sorry, and economic approaches uh, do not explain board realities. You explained, uh, on the other hand, that the reality of the board essentially is a human. Uh, practice and that also the human experience of being in the broad uh, uh, has a huge influence uh, of the broad and in particular uh, the way how board members are perce perceiving themselves their experience uh, could you give us some element to help the participant to better structure also uh, the approach and uh, structure the comprehension of this human experience please Sure, and, and, and thank you very much for raising this question because this is very much at the heart of, of what I do in my, my daily practice and I'm thinking about. Um, what, what we have found out in, in conducting board reviews over the last 10, 12 years is that mostly, not, not exclusively, but mostly what determines the performance of board members, executive and non-executive, in, in their interaction has everything to do with being human and the way that they perceive their reality, the way that they perceive their roles, the way that they understand the interaction, and what they think they should be doing and should not be doing. It is all about their own perception and about how, the, how they learned through their years of experience what to do and what not to do. Those are, ele those are core elements of who they have become as persons and how they perceive the experience they have when they are on a specific board, on what to say and what not to say what moments to stand up, to speak up, what moments to, to stay silent, not intervene, um, not be frank about what you actually feel, what should be done, but stay silent, are careful, uh, wait it out and see if somebody else speaks up, etc. cetera. Um, also, the, 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 all of the areas of conflict or frustration and irritation in the board are, are almost never about substantive issues about how to run the business. They are about how people go about with each other, how they relate to each other, how they interact with each other. That's typically the source of conflict. And also the difficulty in solving the conflict is no irrational way out. There is only a relational way out of those problems, not a rational. If you just put the right argument on the table, suddenly the problem disappears. 
That's simply not how it is. Um, it's a human practice. Human experience determines how we conduct ourselves in that practice. And when we, we look at boards um, and, and see through the years where this experience actually takes shape, there are some core elements that consistently come back in every board setting that determine different types of experiences, but they always determine experiences. One element, for example, is the episodic nature of the board interaction between non-executives and executives. Executives run the, the corporation on a daily basis. Seven days a week, they're involved. They get constant information and feedback, and, uh, and they calibrate constantly their own perception and understanding of the corporate reality. Well, non-executive directors hop in and out. They check in for a meeting, and they may have meetings every six weeks, eight weeks, once a quarter only, but they always check out again. They leave the corporate reality. By definition, they have a different perception of that corporate reality than executives have. For some non-executives, for example, not having too much and consistent information actually makes them very anxious. They are constantly concerned about not knowing what actually is happening on a daily basis because they don't have the information. Other non-executives may feel completely comfortable. As long as nobody tells me anything, I'm assuming nothing is wrong, so I don't have to pay attention, and I'm completely safe. So this episodic nature triggers experience that, to people, non-executives and executives, that determine their behavior, their levels of anxiety or their levels of comfort, for example. Another core element, and, and then I'll stop and, and ask for more questions. One other example of the structural element that is always there is the tension between the formal hierarchy of the non-executives in the board over the executives, typically. They are monitoring the executive, the CEO. They have in their role package the assessments of the performance of the CEO. They, they can take the decision whether to continue with the CEO or not, or try to select a new CEO. That's a formal position of hierarchy. But the CEO typically has the better information about the reality of the corporation, its prospects, its financial uh, performance, and other levels of performance. That real understanding of the business might be much more powerful and take over from the formal hierarchy of non-executives over executives and can create a very ambiguous situation where non-executives feel they have this formal hierarchical role, but actually in practice, the dominant person in the boardroom is the CEO who knows everything, or at least thinks he knows everything, and does not allow others to challenge them from a basis of not knowing as much as he does. So hierarchy in the role play is ambiguous, always ambiguous. How people deal with it, how they experience it, that really determines how effective the board is. As another example of how experience determines board effectiveness. Thank, thank you. Uh... Yeah, but and I see that Ludgard is reacting. And uh, if you may, I, I would like and making echo to what you are saying. Uh, so I will uh, read uh, the question we see from Professor Ludgard uh, Vandenberg, asking you, uh, in line with the emphasis on behavior, should we not focus more on director education to make them the true ambassadors for change toward corporate societal responsibility? Could we not reach faster impact uh, than with new regulations and codes? Well, thank you for that question, Lutgaard, and um, very interesting and challenging too. Um, yes, education is definitely is a part of this. But if the executives don't know it themselves because they don't feel responsible, who is going to educate them if they don't see it, if they don't feel it themselves? How would they educate themselves or how would they invite others from the outside to start to educate themselves? It will have to start somewhere with a sense of, this is our responsibility. And only when you have the sense, then you can start to educate yourself. And I believe absolutely with you, there's a big space for improving education of board members, also in this field, not just in financial aspects of the business, but particularly in how does our business actually affect the world around us? And to what extent do we have an influence there and could we improve our impact in the world around us? Uh, but we will only do that if we have a sense of that responsibility first. And now the question is, where does that sense come from? I, I, I think something needs to be done to give us that sense. And this movement, this dialogue 
is probably increasing that sense. And I, I think, therefore, I welcome very much this type of discussion. The question is if that is going fast enough. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I see. I would like to, to to ask you also, and I will uh, another question, and I will make uh, the link with the question we received from Catherine, uh, because uh, in your contribution uh, in the Libera Mica Home, uh, you also pointed out how much the very nature of the interaction in the board is dialogical. And do you see then specific risks of the board dialogue in the uncertain, term, uh, uncertain times and social dista dista distancing uh, that we are living in? And, and what concrete advices would you give to directors to maintain this dialogue? Catherine was uh, 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 very uh, relevantly making uh, also the question about the digitalization of the board meetings uh, that could uh, harm dynamics and less body language, but uh, body language uh, is very important in that dialogue. No, absolutely. And I think we all have this experience now for the last year that we spend our days behind the screen um, with Zoom and Teams. And actually it is fascinating to see that we can actually do so much in this space like we do today with this webinar. We can actually have a conversation. We can have some sort of dialogue on, on difficult and, and challenging issues. Um, so in, in that sense, it's, in no, it's, it's fascinating that we can now do this. If we would have the COVID crisis five or 10 years ago, we would never have been able to communicate in this way with each other. So in that sense, we're fortunate to have these, ma these means. But yes, absolutely, I think everybody behind the screen feels we're missing something of the human interaction. Um, it is very hard with a group of 10, 20 people in a board setting or otherwise to be fully engaged with each other in finding out and figuring out and understanding how everybody understands and appreciates the nature of the discussion. You miss so much because you only see these very little screens um, and the, 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 so it becomes the, the nature of the discussion becomes much more digital itself. So we talk about something, then we close it and we finish it. And actually we seem to not be able to come back to it anymore because we have another thought. And in a, in a room, we would be able to do that because you would feel the acceptance of that in the body language of others. Now it is just a disruption of the next topic that you want to discuss. This is generally so, certainly that frustrates boards. It's, uh, there are at least three categories of discussions for where Zoom and team meetings are actually hindering us or probably not delivering well enough results. One is the situation where we need to create something together. Uh, from, from where we are, we need to create something new. We have to come up with a new idea that is exploring, that is going into new spaces where we haven't been before together. That's very hard in a digital setting behind the screen. Second is if we have to face difficult dilemmas, difficult trade-offs that we need to discuss, things that are hard to compare and still we need to take a decision about financial performance version versus some moral effect that we may have in the society, for example. How do we, how do we square that? How, what sort of judgment do we make? That's hard behind the screen. Um, and the, and the third one, um, but, yeah, let me see, if you, if you have real moral dilemmas uh, where your identity to some extent is at stake as well, what, what is deep for you, what you feel deeply about, being able to share that in a compassionate way that generates empathy with others and that you're open and willing to listen to that person's concern about something is very hard to do also on the screen. Sometimes it works. I've seen it work over the last year and, and occasionally, but the scope for that is minimal. And I, I think we have to find a way also behind the screen in, a, in digital board meetings to create that sort of reflective space, which basically starts with every, any reflective space which has no agenda. That's the first thing. Don't work with an agenda. Work with questions and trigger associations and reflections. And so one of the things that, that maybe that's the key thing for boards in this Zoom and team reality, uh, we ha only have meetings now with agendas. We don't have agenda-free reflection space together. Maybe it would be a great start to start to do that at least, to include 
time, an hour or so, to simply chat about where we are as a board and as a corporation and what, what we're concerned about, what comes up, what we associate with. That in itself would be some improvement already. Thank, thank you. Yeah, I see already that uh, it's already time with a uh, hot discussion and uh, a lot of questions uh, receiving from uh, our member. Uh, I see still uh, other questions are coming about uh, the right time to onboard a, a new board member uh, in this specific circumstance we are living in. Um, that's quite... Uh, an important case. I don't know because we are a last discussion, also a last question for uh, for you also before concluding. If you uh, would like to take a few minutes to answer, so we, we, um, at Randstad we onboarded a new board member in April this year, and I think that she she has become a very effective board member quite quickly um, in in our reality, and I think one thing that has helped is that we have engaged with her as other board members individually on a one-on-one -on -one basis at least two or three times each of us with her having had discussion again agenda free discussions about what we think is important in this board in this corporation what it is about that gave her a leg up sort of reflective information basis on which to start to become an effective board member herself is it is it successful it probably definitely would have been better if we would have been able to meet in person, but some of that can be done still. Thank you. Yeah, and to conclude uh, on this topic, uh, topic governance, resilience, and purpose, uh, and looking uh, with our members to the future, uh, what would be your hope for resilient organization and the people uh, who make them up? What uh, message uh, would you like to send them now? I think the, the key message for my part, both on the societal responsibility and also on the digital transformation and the digital board meetings, and is that basically we have to be courageous enough to be human again in our board space, in our decision making, in the way that we go about with each other, in the way that we are able to deal with our deepest human concerns that we all have and do not leave them at home for, for real personal discussion somewhere else, but include them in the reality in which we take the responsibility as board members. I think if we allow ourselves to base ourselves more again on our human nature, on our excellences, our judgment, our inspiration, and our morality, I think we can be much stronger than the, the T.S. Eliot type of system that tries to avoid us having to be good at all. I think we need to be good, we need to want to be good rather than relying on a system that can break easily. And I think it's, it has something to do intuitively. I, I'm not an expert in this, but intuitively, when we build these systems, they seem to feel like very hard, concrete, with rectangles, with digital notions. It's either this or that. It's never nuanced or associations. It's intuitions. Those things can break easily. The things that are strongest in real life are natural organic materials that move. Reed moves in the wind. It doesn't break because of wind. It can withstand wind, it can move with it and stay in the same place at the same time. A spider creates a spider web out of extraordinary lightweight material. And in the life scale of a spider, it becomes extraordinarily strong for its purposes. I think we need to rely a little bit more on that as humans make ourselves strong again as humans rather than relying on systems to do the work for us. Thank you very much. Yeah, but I see that we are uh, over the, the, the time and uh, with such uh, a topic and, and your inspiring uh, ideas. Thank you very much for having uh, shared them uh, with us. Um, I, I see a lot of congratulations and people thanking uh, you, uh, um, wishing you be courageous enough to be human uh, again. Uh, thank you, Professor Winter, for this wisdom and advice to the board. Uh, Christoph Marcus uh, is um, wishing uh, you this. Uh, uh, and thank you, Christoph. So uh, uh, that's why. I, I, I read uh, uh, um, 
for all the, the participants uh, tonight. Thank you, uh, Yarp, uh, for the exchange. Uh, I hope that um, we will go on on that uh, topic also, having other opportunities to share and to hear such uh, experience and uh, an ID. And uh, let me uh, still uh, remind you to the participants, uh, the next uh, appointment of the Home of Governance uh, talk, my colleague Lisbeth uh, de Ridder uh, will welcome Francis Blake, uh, who is a uh, well-known uh, family business entrepreneur, Belgian entrepreneur, uh, uh, the current pre uh, chairman of Derbigum Imperbel, uh, and they will uh, exchange and uh, list listen to the uh, experience around resilience in a family uh, business uh, with him. So have all a very good evening. Uh, take care of each of you and uh, maybe as soon as possible <laughs> in more real life. Bye. Thank you very much for moderating this. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Iap. Have a nice evening. Have all a nice uh, evening and see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hi, Rachel. We, we can. Oops. <laughs> Hi, Brit. Hi. I don't see um, any participants anymore. So I think. No, uh, uh, just in the chat, then we are alone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How was my accent and pronunciation? I think uh, I, I had the impression not to pronounce uh, very well and not good enough. To think. Oh, no? I think you did very well, Rachel. Was it okay for, with my way yes. of speaking and, and with the yes. words? Uh, okay, because the, the thought.